Okay, so in this video I'm going to talk a bit about circular motion and the conditions of circular motion and then I'm going to link it into satellites and look at a couple of different types of satellites and how circular motion impacts where they need to be put in orbit and how they're used. Okay, so to start off with a couple of things we just need to know about, so the factual stuff that you just need to know. There are a few different properties that we need to look at here. So the first one is called angular velocity. So when an object is moving in a circle, angular velocity is the number of radians it travels divided by the time it takes to travel do that. So if we just sketch a circle and we draw two radii like this. So let's say it started at this position here, ended at this position there. So it's gone through an angle theta, so to calculate the angular speed it would be the angle through which it's turned divided by the time it took to get to that point. Okay, so that's angular speed and it's important that this angle is given in radians or none of these equations will work, so we're going to be dealing in radians when we're doing circular motion. The next one is tangential velocity, so Angular speed is in radians per second. Tangential velocity is the actual velocity of the object at a given point in time. So its unit is a meters per second. And the way we can calculate that is from the angular speed. So it's going to be the angular speed multiplied by the radius of the circle. And that's how you get velocity. If you want to know where these equations come from, I'm going to make another video where I derive these equations and explain in terms of maths where they come from. But in terms of this, this is the equation we're going to be using here. So that's V, tangential velocity, is the radius times the angular speed. And the last part is the time period, and that's the time it takes for one complete orbit. So the time it takes for a satellite to go round the Earth once, for instance. And we can link the angular speed and the time period using this equation here. So your angular speed is 2 pi divided by the time period. So you can see on the top line, this is how you get your units. You've got 2 pi, so in radians, and then time on the bottom line, so radians per second. Okay, so that's some of the basics. Let's take a look a bit more in depth. Okay, so what is circular motion? Because it's something, it's quite a precise condition. So it's when an object is caused to move in a circular path by a force acting towards the center of that circle. So you can see here a satellite is moving in this circular path here and when it's at this location it's being acted on by a force in this direction towards Earth, so towards the centre of the circle. So that's in circular motion. But it's a little bit more precise than that. So a few things. First of all, this object here must be moving at constant speed, so constant angular speed and constant tangential speed. You'll notice I said speed, not velocity, because the direction is changing, so it's not constant velocity, but it is constant speed. And it must have been acted on by a constant center-seeking force. And this is the one times people get tripped up in some questions, asking whether something's moving in circular motion. It must be a constant center-seeking force. And this centre-seeking force is called a centripetal force. That's the correct name for a centre-seeking force. Centripetal actually means centre-seeking. Make sure you don't get this confused with centrifugal, which a lot of people do. You will never co come across centrifugal forces in A-level physics. It's far too complicated for that. We're always dealing with centripetal forces. Okay, so that's the basics of circular motion. So, when do you come across a circular motion, because if those are very precise conditions. So there are a few different areas you'll come across this in the A-level course. So the first one is the one we've looked at, so gravitational force, so a satellite moving around an object, a planet moving around a star, a star moving around a black hole at the centre of a galaxy, anything like that. Anything time something's in a circular orbit, it's in circular motion, because the force is the constant throughout. Another time would be in atomic structure, where you have electrons in orbit around a nucleus. So in that case, the electromagnetic interaction provides the centripetal force there. 
We have cars driving around a bend, so if they maintain their speed when they're going around a bend, the friction provides the centripetal force. And you'll look at examples like in a velodrome, why they tilt the, the, the floor essentially to get better use of this so they can go at faster speed. And then one of the last ones you come across is where you have an object on a string and you make it move in a horizontal path. And you'll probably look at examples where it's moving in a vertical path and it's about working out why that's actually not true circular motion necessarily. But we'll come across that. Okay, so how do you actually get an object to move in a circular path? So we know the conditions that are required, but how do you actually get it into that? Well, the key thing is, if we have an object here, say for instance, the gravitational force is going to try and make it accelerate this way. So the force from the Earth will cause it to accelerate this way. But our object has speed in this direction here, that's why it's called tangential velocity, because it's tangent to the, this planet here. So, if we slowly increase the speed, so from zero, if it was zero, it would just go straight down, if it's traveling this way, it would follow a, par a parabolic path, and the faster it gets, the sort of longer this parabola is going to be, until we reach a certain speed, where actually the Earth falls away, at the same rate that the object falls towards the ground, and so it would follow this path. So the key thing is, what is that speed? Well, it's calculated using this equation, and as I said earlier, I'll derive these equations in another video if you're interested, but this is the equation that links it. So the centripetal force is this F, and in order to move in circular motion, the mass of the object times the velocity of the object squared divided by the radius of orbit must be equal to that force. I remember earlier we had the v equals r omega, so we can substitute that in there and we end up with f equals m omega squared r. So either of these two are expressions of the same equation, it just depends what information you've been given in a question. Okay. So let's go back into the context where we're looking at. So we're looking at satellites and how they operate. So there's two key types of satellite that you're going to come across in this course. And the first one is called a geostationary or a geosynchronous type satellite. And they're ones that orbit directly above the equator. And they have the same time periods there, so it takes 24 hours for them to go around the one complete orbit. So it has the same time period. And so, incidentally, if it has the same time period, it has the same angular speed. And because they're above the same point, it's quite useful for our communication. So, like mobile phone satellites, for instance, because we just need our aerials pointing at the same point in the sky to maintain contact, which is really useful. The other type of satellite is a polar orbit type ones, and they're called that because the orbits go over the poles, so they're not around the equator this time. And their time periods tend to be shorter, so sort of six to eight hours, so it can be less, can be more, but around that sort of time. And the reason they do this is that allows them to cover a large amount of the Earth, so in eight hours it will do a complete lap of the Earth and it's covered a lot of terrain, which makes them really good for mapping the surface of the Earth and doing things like weather forecasting and that type of thing, because you can track cloud patterns and that kind of thing, or look at hurricanes and that kind of stuff. So those are a couple of the satellites. And one of the common things they get you to do is actually calculate the radius of a geostationary satellite. So I'm going to show you that now as an example of putting this all. Okay, so the radius of a geostationary satellite. So first of all, we need to know what the centripetal force is. Because we're going to equate this to mv squared over r. The force, remember from Newton's law of gravitation, is calculated like this. And we also know it must be equal to the mass times velocity squared. Now remember, this is the mass of the, orb, the object in circular motion, and this little m is the mass of the object as well. So these two m's are the same. So let's equate these two.
Um, so first off, we can eliminate these M's. And if we want to get the radius, we want to get um, that by itself on one side. So let's do that as well. Oh, so we can calculate that, cancel across those. So let's take VR over to that side. So we've got R is GM over the velocity square. Now, let's think about what we know this. It's in our formula sheet. We know this is in our formula sheet, but we don't currently know what this is. But we do know that the time period of a geostationary satellite is 24 hours. So this is 24 hours. So we need to convert it into seconds. So that's into minutes. That's into seconds. And this is this value here. When you've done a lot of these calculations, you've just got these memorized. OK. And remembering that the omega is 2 pi over t, which is uh, 7.27. To da, 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 times 10 to the minus 5 radians per second. Now we're going to need to convert this. So, what we're going to do is to modify our original equation a bit. So, we had gm over v squared, but remember v is our omega, so let's make that substitution. So now we've got it in terms of things that we have calculated already, which is ideal. Ooh. So we can get R is the cube root of gm over omega squared, which is the cube root of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. It's in your formula sheet. And the mass of the Earth is 6.0 times 24. Sometimes you will see it as 5.97, but I'm going to stick with this one. And 2 blah 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 times 10 to the minus 5. All squared. Okay, so now we're at a point where we can do some useful stuff. And we get an answer of 4.2 times 10 to the 7 meters. Remembering I used mass of the earth to two sig figs so I give the answer here to two significant figures as well. Also remembering I used 24 hours to two sig figs again this would limit this to two significant figures. As usual there's a nice typed out um, solution to this problem here and so in case you couldn't read my handwriting.